I remember one gentleman, say, a former colleague, said to me, but you're crazy. You, how could you leave heart? You know, look at the office that you have left to come here, look at what you have. And I said, you know, it depends on what motivates you at a particular point in time in your life. I would describe myself as a career public servant. And I say public servant because I have served both in public bodies as well as the central government. When you say career now, how many years are we talking about in the public service? Over 40 years. Wow over 40, 40 years. years. I've not worked formally anywhere besides the, um, the public service. My first love was nursing and I had applied to uh, pursue a nursing career but there were aspects that I could not deal with. Hmm. For example, I was afraid of blood. I would just fall apart. But I loved nursing because, you know, I, I thought that that is what I wanted to do, to help to take care of people. And then I was inspired next to pursue a career in teaching. Because at primary school, primary school level, I had some teachers who made some very significant and indelible mark on my life as a person. Um, I, I just never understood until I became older why they took such personal interest in me. And I recall one of them at once because I was a very frisky child. They used to call me in school, my teachers in primary school, Mosquito Picnic, because I was all over the place, very active and hyper, hyperactive, I would say. And one told me once that she saw that I had potential and it was her responsibility to extract it. And so I decided, okay, I will go into teaching. And that's when, after I left high school, I, I didn't go to sixth form because there was an unfortunate incident at my school with some sixth formers the, the year before my group. That's with school. Very technical high school with the great Ben Francis. And they suspended the sixth form program. So. I went to work and my first job, temporary job, was in a ministry. While there, I applied to go to um, Short to Teachers College and I was accepted and I did my program, teacher training program. And then, after Teachers College, I went overseas to pursue um, a degree program in elementary education and educational psychology and that's where I met the former Governor General Sir Kenneth Hall. He was there lecturing at the time. He lectured me in African history and uh, there were several other Jamaicans there and we became very close. We formed a bond amongst the Jamaicans and with Sir Ken, no Sir Kenneth. I came back to Jamaica, taught for a while, and uh, I got the opportunity while I was at Girlstone, Jamaica, because I always wanted to work where I thought that I could help the less fortunate. And at that time, Girlstone, Jamaica, it was an um, institution, a training institution, privately trained institution, but it would get subvention from the Ministry of Education then. That was what year? That was 19... I went there, I think, 1980. And I remained there for four years. And the then um, chairman of Pearlstone was the first managing director for Heart Trust NTA when it was launched in 1982, Dr. Joyce Robinson. And being the type of person she was, she ensured that all of us got involved with this new program. So she used to take me with her in the evenings to go work on preparation for the launch of HEART. And as a result, many of us from there, we got integrally involved with the um, establishment of HEART Trust. 
and in 1984 I decided I liked the concept of what heart stood for and I decided that I would want to move on and broaden my horizon you know okay. and I applied for and went and worked with Heart Trust NT for so you left Girlstone to Girlstone, heart yes and 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 it was the concept were similar because Girlstone was established for young women who really never made it to the secondary school level and um, they would they would teach them skills so I taught home economics and dressmaking wow. there, as well as English language oh. I spent 20 years at heart I started off as um, technical assistant and was promoted through the ranks until I became the director of academies where I was responsible. I had all the training institutions in heart reporting to me. And um, in 2004, I felt the urge to return to the public, to the civil service. And I looked around, I started to search. People never thought that I was serious, but um, because you know, in terms, if you were looking at salaries, heart would have been the place to be at that time. And in a senior executive, an executive position there, you would consider that you would be comfortable. But then I had this desire because I thought that I had peaked at heart and uh, I decided that I had something else that I would want to offer and uh, hearing some of the challenges that of the um, the civil service I thought that that's where I wanted to be and I, so I took a conscious decision that I would move on from heart and I started to skirt around looking specifically for opportunities in the civil service and uh, there it was where I saw a job advertised for director principal for the Justice Training Institute under the Ministry of Justice. And when I looked at it, I said, but this is the perfect job for me because um, it, it, it entails doing exactly what I was doing. But this time it was um, sector specific for the justice sector. And I recall saying to a friend, you know, I am looking, I want to go back to the, the, the civil service. He was in the civil service at the time. And I see this job, I, I think that this would be the perfect job for me, but there's one drawback, and that it requires someone with a, a law degree, which I don't have. He said to me, try, if that's where the Lord is leading you, that's where you will be and I applied and to be honest I was a bit surprised because I had heard that you know they, they were really very specific because it relates to the the, the justice system. Mm -hmm. I applied and I was called for interview with other persons and surely that's where the Lord wanted me. I was offered the job. I must say that people thought I was crazy because how could you leave your lofty job? They came, they looked at my office. It was nothing compared to what I had at heart. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember one gentleman, say, a former colleague, said to me, but you're crazy. You, how could you leave heart? You know, look at the office that you have left to come here. Look at what you have. And I said, you know, it depends on what motivates you at a particular point in time in your life. Here it is not money. Here it's really the desire to give myself, to offer service to the civil service because all you could hear were criticisms about the civil service and I committed to myself that I wanted to come and I wanted to make a difference. Mm -hmm. To date I have no regrets. Mm -hmm. Of course there were challenges because I remember there was a group that was adamant that I shouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. Doesn't and they would come, degree. yes, and they would come and they came one day and they said, look, we have here, and 
I mean, these people are not lawyers themselves, but they call themselves justices. And we have this case here where we are being asked to advise with divorce um, for um, France. And I just politely told him, I said, look here, you all know, don't bother to go there. You all know that I don't have a law degree, but I'm employed to do a job and I am doing the job to the best of my ability. So, you know, don't bother with it. And I can tell you that I am of the view that the work that we did was significant and none of the persons on staff had a law degree, but our work was impactful. 2004, I was toying with the idea of whether I should seek overseas employment. Lots of things were happening in my life and I, some of my friends were going overseas to teach and so and I toyed with that idea. And one day, um, a Sunday, I saw in the Gleaner that there was an advertisement to ask for applications, to request applications for persons who are interested in serving at senior executive levels and permanent secretary levels in government. Mm -hmm. And uh, I told myself, I said, this is, not, this is not for me. Uh, this, this, is, this is really not for me. And one day I sat in my office and one of my... This is at JTI. At JTI. Yeah. One of my part-time lecturers, he came in for something. And he said to me, Mrs. S, he called Mrs. S, still does. Um, did you see the ad in the paper? And I said, yes. And he said, have you applied? And I said, no. I said, no man, that, that's, that's not for me. Then they wouldn't want to consider lowly me for those big jobs in government. I am comfortable very much. And you know, he pressed me and pressed me until I said, well, I remembered my experience getting to where I'm at. Right. So, right. and uh, you know, I'm a woman of faith. Yeah. So let me try. Yeah. Because it, there will be no harm yes. in, in trying. Yeah, in trying, yes. And I applied. And when I applied, I started, I was called for interview. Mm -hmm. So I started to do my research mm -hmm. to say where the vacancies were okay. at the time. And then I learned that there was a vacancy at the Ministry of Education. Okay. And when I went, you know, they mentioned more than one ministry. And uh, I said, let me think about it. So I left. And I was called for a second interview. Mm -hmm. And when I went back, I told them, you know, I've thought about it, I've prayed about it, and I think the Lord is directing me to the Ministry of Education. I said, that's what my training is, my background, my passion. And um, the rest is history. Yes. I was um, offered the Permanent Secretary's post at the Ministry of Education, which I took up. October 13, um, 19, 2014 mm -hmm. and um, I served there at that time Mr. Holness was the Minister of Education. For me one of the most rewarding things is that I did try to bring together the the school system and the ministry because you would believe that the school system is out there they don't they didn't see themselves as part of the okay. ministry of education okay. it's us right. and that it is the, them yes. okay. so we did a lot we reached out a lot um, I planned programs where we would go out meet with the principals meet with the boards meet with the bursars we determined that we were going to empower them and so I spent um, four years plus there and uh, the first of, I remember, I think it was November 1, 2011, I was called by the cabinet secretary to inform me that I was going to be reassigned as of the following day, no, it was the, the last day of October, I will be absent as of the 1st of November um, 2011 to the ministry, the then Ministry of Transport and Works. It took months for me to get my 
things from education because I just left, went home, and the following day I You're reported to. Oh, 24 hour change. Yes, and it should have been a one month um, assignment because yes. the then permanent secretary had gone on leave. Okay. And then um, come December 2011, there was a general election and the administration changed. And so I had a new minister who, who was um, Dr. Omar Davies. Okay. So he, he um, assumed leadership of the ministry January 2012. But all this time, my heart but, and mind. But this would have so it would have been just months apart, November to yes. January. Yes, I, yes. As my initial assignment was just up to the end of December. Oh, okay. It was so a one month assignment. Okay, so you were always going to go back to MOE. My in my head. Yes. yes. That okay. and you know and I don't know how how much I had annoyed Dr. Davies <laughs> by going to tell him several times that. Sir, remember that my substantive mm -hmm. post is at education, I'm going back. So initially, you know, my mindset was just to be there, mm -hmm. to have cover as a permanent secretary, because under the constitution, you cannot have the, a minister without a permanent secretary. secretary. All right. And you know, one day, one of these days again, I was walking across to his office to tell him, no, this is it, I, I really think I, I should go back. And there, something in me said, no, stop, go back, don't, because I figured, you know, I don't know if it's the Lord who spoke to me. Well, I figured it was the Lord who mm. spoke to me. And I went back and sat at my desk and I said, Lord, what is this? What do you have in store for me? Mm. And um, I stayed. I remained until, again, there was um, 2016. So when that administration changed, I got a new minister and the minister became Minister of Transport and Mining. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mr. Michael, Mike that's, Henry. That's 2016. 2016. Oh, right. Right. So the new ministries were established in March 2016. Mm -hmm. And um, I was at Transport and Mining. Mm -hmm. And as is customary, the cabinet secretary called me sometime in May 2016 to tell me that I was being reassigned to the newly formed Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation. How many ministers would you have worked <laughs> with um, since MOE? Because uh, I'm, I'm, I'm at about a... 10 here. Yes. Ten I, ministers I, I'm more in than, about four ministries. So can we just go through quickly? So yes, yeah. transport and mining, I had Minister Mike Henry at first. Mm -hmm. And then when it became transport, uh, works and housing, I had three ministers. So it was Minister Davies, okay. Minister Guy, and Davies. Minister Azan. And then when I left and went to MEGJC, Okay, I had the Prime Minister, PM, uh -huh. I had Minister Vaz, I had Minister Chang, uh -huh. and Minister Warmington. Uh -huh. When Minister Chang left, uh -huh. Minister Samuda came, I think. I'm looking at least about 10, yes. and across four ministries. Yes. 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 Education. Transport and Works, Transport, Transport and Works and Housing, work MEGJC, OPM. How do you do it? Because as it is, you are the only permanent secretary right now that is running two massive government ministries. And we have to underscore that the permanent secretary is the accounting head of the ministry. Uh, well, Actually, I had three ministries up to the 1st of March. After the last election in 2016, mm -hmm. in 2020, when 2020. was 2020, September mm -hmm. 2020, I was asked to carry the new ministry, Housing, Urban Renewal, Environment and Climate Change. And I did that up to the 1st of March. So where a new permanent secretary was recently appointed. How do I do, did I do it or have I done yes, it? Yes, how are you doing okay, it? Yes. So one of the things um, for me that has worked for me is um, just being, just ensuring that you have 
the systems, the proper systems in place. You have to, and also accountability. Accountability. I, at MEGJC, -E many times I'm not physically there, but we ensure that we follow the rules, we establish policies, procedures, and I tend to hold people accountable. And being somebody who has, you know, I've lectured in management, human resource management, and so on and so forth. And one of the things you are trained is that at the higher level, you don't need to know certain things. I mean, you know, you don't, certain information you don't need to have. But in government, particularly permanent secretaries, you have to put yourself in a position of knowledge at yes. all times. I ensure because some persons, the kind of passion that we had in terms of the government service, we could, I remember we were trained, you had to know everything, circular number, so and so, section, mm -hmm. so and so, subsection, so and so. Some persons don't take time now mm -hmm. to know what mm -hmm. the policies are. Mm -hmm. And we could advise, even though, even at a clerical level, you know, mm -hmm. you could go to your director and say, sit the circular here, sir, what you're saying cannot be done that way. Oh, okay. No, okay. things will come to you. People don't take pride yes. in garnering the required knowledge to enable them to work mm. efficiently. And so you can't take your fingers off the pulse either. Yes. Because when I am called to PAC or PAAC, I can't say to them, you come, come explain because you're the one who caused me to do so and so. So you have to yourself, yes. put yourself in a position that you are knowledgeable yes. as well about government's policies and procedures. Can Audrey afford to do anything for fun? I know that you're a strong woman of faith. Yes. Um, and I know you love your church and you go to your church. How do you... Um, aren't Relax. you afraid that God is going to punish you when you have to work on a Saturday because you're... Well, I don't work. It depends on, on, on what, though. Yeah. Because, for example, suppose I hear that, um, you know, that a family, like housing was under me and yeah. the family was, you know, there was a heavy storm and they don't have anywhere to live, the house was destroyed. And mm -hmm. I'd, I'm not going to say I wouldn't go to look and to assess and carry assistance that's what God would want you to do right. but in terms of formally I I don't engage yes, okay. I uh, you know I, I really subscribe to the notion that the day is the Lord's yes. and so but um I spend a lot of time I, I find a lot of joy in doing things at home I do a lot of things around the house I like to cook and being a, a former home teacher, mm -hmm. I cook a lot. And yes. so wherever I go, I always find myself in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. I go for vacation overseas, and they put down the food and they say, sit there. Okay, I have no. to cook for them, yes. Oh, I see. bake too. Yes. I do wedding cakes. Yes. And many of the, of the young people at my church, when they're getting married, they ask me to do their cakes. Yes. And I just enjoy it. Yes. It's, it's like, you know, a, a full-time pastime for me. Yeah. Why do you think yourself and Carol Palmer are so, one, highly respected and two, feared in the public sector? Feared? Yes, um, <laughs> and even amongst other public, um, other permanent secretaries. Um, no, so I'm afraid of them. <laughs> if, uh, I didn't know. Of, yes. Well, um, I can't. <laughs> And I probably I can speak a bit about my colleague having worked for her. I really don't like the idea of people taking the poor people's money in the sense that I used to say to them when I was at education, looking through my window, I see a man cutting the grass and I said, come here, look there. Do you know that whatever he spends, the little he's getting, he's he's paying tax to purchase goods so that you and I may be paid. Let us ask ourselves, are we doing justice to him in terms of their ch his children in the education system? Think about it. 
And I always say to my colleagues, look, the job you're in, even the one that I am in as a permanent secretary, hundreds of thousands of more qualified persons out there are available for the job. So consider it a privilege and an honor. I don't like people who take the job. They come and they convince you at interviews and they give them the job. And once they come on yes. and they get appointed because they know of the challenges yes. um, that we have in terms of it's it's not easy to terminate persons in the public service and the long procedure and sometimes they don't bother and they come and they don't care they have poor punctuality they have poor attendance they come to work the output is very low they're unprofessional the way they speak to people on the phone the customer service is very poor and so i demand a lot from them and don't tell me about the pay because none of us is getting pay at the level that we believe we value, we are valued. Mm -hmm. And so, if you take the job, you're going to do the work for me. Mm -hmm. And if it is, if you're so disgruntled that it is going to spill over, where you treat people badly, you don't do any work, and you're getting taxpayers' money, you're going to have a problem with me. Mm -hmm. I tell my people, any day, that I give you any instruction that is untoward, that is not in keeping with good principles, with government's policy, go and report me. You would never find me. I tell them I am not asking anybody to do me any favors, anything that is outside of the rules. You know why? I must never at any time find myself in a position where I cannot look you straight in the eyes and give you a directive. Or if I have to sanction you for anything, I have to say, boy, you know, I have to think twice. Mm. I must never find myself in that position. Mm. And I have tried over the years not to. Mm. I try to ensure that whatever I do, I will not be found wanting in terms of my integrity. And when I go down to PAC, you know, and they are ranting, I, I, I say, I make mistakes, but I, I'm not corrupt. One of the fallacies out there is that the brighter people are in the private sector. It's not true. You have some of the brightest people in the public service. It's how though we harness those knowledge, skills, and competencies and direct them. Some of them are constrained because, you know, we are very rules-based and you can't, like, innovate like you can do in the private sector. And this is something that people don't look at at times. But I would, having gone through, spent all my life in the public sector, it is something that I would do again. I'm not sure that I would want to be a permanent secretary and get given the level of responsibility. Mm -hmm. But I would do it again. It's a very rewarding period of, of my life and I would commend it to any young person.